Welcome to Rangeland Principles. My name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho and today we're going to talk about measuring rangelands and we're going to discuss some of the tools and methods we use to do that. So we've talked about a lot of the abiotic attributes that you might want to collect on a rangeland, things like soil texture, soil depth, those kind of attributes are really important when we're thinking about rangeland health or trying to figure out what's happening on the rangeland. But there's also a lot of biotic attributes that we should measure, and we're going to talk about some of the vegetation attributes today. We'll start with plant species. So plant species is just a genetically unique plant, and we have hundreds, maybe even thousands of plant species on rangelands here in the West. And you can see from these pictures, these are three plants that you should have memorized for this class, but each one is its own plant species. So we have blue grandma, we have cheatgrass, and we have tailcup lupin. So each of those is a plant species and could be a unit when we're measuring any kind of vegetation attributes on the range. We could also look at the lifespan of different plants. It kind of depends on what our objectives are for the range. Are we interested in knowing the exact plant species or if we understand lifespan, is that going to be enough information to understand or to gauge whether we're meeting our objectives of the range? So for example, on the last one we talked about individual species. Here is lifespan, so you could measure different plants, whether they're perennials or whether they're annuals, biennials, all of those lifespan characteristics that we discussed. Functional groups is a type of vegetation attribute that we actually measure quite a bit in rangelands. Or often, even when we collect plant species data, we'll often cat or group it together into functional groups. And basically, when we think of functional groups, we're thinking about how plants function on the landscape, meaning where do they get their water from, how do they cycle their nutrients, and, and really do they respond similar to disturbance or to management. And then when we kind of start to assign those different characteristics, we start to group them together. So they're functionally similar, they're going to respond similarly on the landscape. So here's just a picture of some functional groups that we often use in range. So you can see that we have deep-rooted perennial bunch grasses, for example. This is a blue bunch plant. You can see the roots. You can see that it's going to act differently than, say, the shallow-rooted perennial bunch grass that's next to it, which is Poa secunda. So they have different profiles in the soil where they can access different nutrients, and so they behave a little bit different when there's disturbances or any kind of management practices. Sagebrush, again, is a taproot species. It often uses water and resources that... Um, can be accessed by deep-rooted perennial bunch grasses because it can go much, much deeper in the soil profile. So those are just some of the, a few of the categories that we might want to use when we're thinking about functional groups. There are a lot of different monitoring methods that you can use to measure rangelands. We're going to discuss these six today, but know that there are a lot of different methods that um, can help you monitor whether you're achieving the objectives that you set for the landscape or not. A lot of times when we're choosing monitoring methods, we think about those SMART objectives, and one of those categories is to make sure that it's realistic, and we want to make sure that we have resources to um, actually monitor what we want. So we want to make sure it's efficient and effective. Frequency is one of the methods that is used here and there in rangelands. It's a measure of how often a plant occurs within a, a certain sample area. So it's a lot of time present absence type data. Um, from that, we can get proportions of time that it occurs over the whole number of plots that we examined. So for example, let's say that these are the plots that we measured on the rangeland. And again, all plants that you should be familiar with for this class. And so if I say, what is the frequency of cheatgrass, for example? You could look at these pictures and see that in these, this, these five sample areas that I'm, I'm looking at, cheatgrass is in two out of the five observations. So therefore, we could say the frequency is 40%. So what if I say, what is the frequency of sagebrush? Again, you can see that it occurs on one of the five plots observed. So we could say the frequency of sagebrush is 20%.
Another method would be to measure density, and density is the number of individuals per unit area. So oftentimes when we're referring to density, we say plants per meter square, or plants per hectare, or plants per acre. All of those have a unit area and a number of individuals associated with them. So let's look at this fake plant community that I drew. So we have an area or a quadrat that's one meter by one meter. And within that quadrat, we have a lot of different plant species or shapes and colors that I've drawn. So if I ask you the question, what is the density of yellow triangles, what would you say? Well, we know that there's two yellow triangles, and we say per unit area, which is per meter square in this situation. So what is the density of circles? So again, you just want to count up the number of circles that it was, is within this unit area, and that would tell you that there's eight circles per meter square. Density measurements are a pretty common measurement on rangelands. So here's an example of some of the work I did a few years ago where I wanted to see, and the group I was working with, wanted to see um, how many juniper plants we had on this watershed. And, and then we wanted to do treatments where we went and removed the fuel. So this is an area where juniper were encroaching on sagebrush step, and so we wanted to get rid of them so we could increase our sagebrush and our um, herbaceous understory, those grasses and forbs underneath. So we could go out and we could measure all of the different trees. We could count the trees in a unit area and then scale up. Or in this example, I actually used remote sensing to count the number of trees because we were in a really large watershed. So this red box is my unit area, and that red box is a tenth of a hectare. And within that, I classified juniper trees, and then I extracted that to get my density. So this is just another option, but we'll just count them. So if I wanted to say, what is the number of juniper trees per hectare? You can look at the imagery and you could quickly count the juniper and say, we had 20 juniper per 10th hectare, or you could say we had 200 junipers per hectare because we want to scale up to a more manageable um, level. So cover is another pretty common measurement on rangelands. And this is just the proportion of the ground surface that's covered by vegetation or other objects. Other objects meaning rocks, moss, lichen, bare ground, um, other objects could even include litter, which is any kind of de detached debris on the surface. So basically, you can look at a quadrat, for example, or a plot in this situation, and you could estimate it. You could estimate your cover by plant species. You could estimate your cover by life forms or even growth forms, for example. So you can see that we have several forbs growing in this picture. Um, Basically, if it fills that whole quadrant, then you would say it's 100% cover. If it fills half of the quadrant, then it's 50%. And then there's this little quadrant up here, and that's about a tenth of the quadrant. So if it fits, if all the plants fit into that, then that would be about a tenth of a, or 10% cover. Another method that you can use to measure cover besides the plot that we just talked about would be points. And in this example, this is the line point intercept method, which is used to estimate cover. So here we have a transect of known length, and on that transect, we drop points at, in certain increments and measure or record what we hit at each of those points. So for example, let's say that we want to know the cover of our perennial bunch grasses. And so we run a transect, and on that transect, we know that we're going to drop a pin 31 times. All along that transect, we actually recorded that we hit perennial grasses 12 out of the 31 times available. So you just divide the number of hits by the total number sampled, and you can get or see that we estimate our perennial bunch grass cover to be 39%. So just like we did the perennial grasses, now try to do it for this annual grass scenario. So our transects stay the same, and we have 31 points that we can sample. But this time when we dropped our pin or recorded our information, we hit annual grasses 21 out of the 31 times. 
So what would be our percent cover of annual grasses? So if you divide 21, or yeah, 21 divided by 31 is going to be 68%. There are a lot of different methods to measure cover, but this is just one example that I want to show you today. So we're going to do the line point intercept method just like we did on the previous slide, except here we have my little fake plant community again. So here I have three transects, and they're the purple lines. And on each of those transects, I drop a pin four times, and that's marked by those X's. So if I ask the question, estimate the cover of red circles using line point intercept, what would you do? Hopefully, you would look at the plot and you would go down each of the transects and count the number of times that you hit red circles. So for example, we hit a red circle right here, and then we keep moving along the transect. We hit a red circle here. We didn't hit any red circles in that center transect. And on the far right transect, we hit a red circle once. So you would say that we hit the red circle three times out of the 12 points that we sampled. So our estimated cover for this plot would be 25%. Another method we use quite regularly on rangelands is biomass. So biomass is super important because it helps us know how productive our site is and also influences a lot of our management strategies. So biomass is just the total weight of living organisms, including plant and animals, for a given area. Often when we're measuring biomass, most of the time we actually go out and we start clipping different known areas and then we take the, the plants that we clipped or the litter and we put it in bags and we dry it and then we get an estimated weight for a certain area. So here, for example, is our quadrat just like we have and there's a few different ways you can clip vegetation. You could clip it by this season's growth, for example, if you're interested in just looking at at your productivity that one year. You can clip it by different functional groups, which is something that I often do. I like to see how much biomass my annual grasses, for example, are producing versus my perennial species that are more ideal. So I often separate them and bag them in individual bags. Once we have everything bagged, we go back to the lab, we dry it out, and then we make estimates, typically, of how much biomass we have on the landscape. So for example, I'm doing a study right now where I'm using cows um, to winter graze a certain area that has a lot of medusa head. And medusa head is an invasive annual grass, and it's just a pain, just like cheatgrass. But basically the idea is to, is to put the cows out there in the winter so that they can graze the medusa head, which is, is fairly palatable that time of year, but won't injure our native perennial bunch grasses because they're dormant because it's over winter. So I'm going out next week, for example, and I'm going to click, clip a bunch of plots, and then I'm going to put the cows out. And then after the cows, I'm going to go clip again so I can see how much biomass I started with and then how much we were actually able to reduce it with our cows. So that's just an example of when you might want to use biomass. So another way you can estimate biomass is by visually estimating how much biomass or plant materials out on that landscape. So this is a good method once you have calibrated yourself and get an idea about, um, about the pounds per acre that you're working with. So when I'm doing any kind of studies, I like to clip for quite a while before I feel comfortable making visual estimates of my biomass but other people have really calibrated their eyes and can make pretty good estimates. So this is one that you really have to practice, I think, to get right. But anyways, I like, I like this image because it tells us the precipitation and also tells us the biomass or the production in pounds per acre. So you can see in that 1957 example, this is crested wheatgrass, and it's about 846 pounds per acre. And then you can see in 1960, we had a decline in our precipitation, and we also had a decline in our production. 
So obviously you can see that we have less biomass and visually it's estimated to be about 186 pounds per acre. So you could do that for the same on the bottom. So again, you had a great year where you had high production followed by a lower production year. So you can see the fluctuation in biomass. So again, oftentimes biomass isn't used when we're trying to assess whether a community is always healthy or not because it does fluctuate a lot by precipitation. But it gives us a great or it's a great tool to help us manage the land. So if we're looking at fuels, for example, and fuel continuity, biomass is pretty good because we can get a lot of information about whether our fuels are connected. Or say that we're a livestock producer. We want to make sure that we're utilizing the resources that we have, those renewable resources, so we can be somewhat flexible based on precipitation and production. So we just talked about biomass and we focused on herbaceous materials, grasses mainly, but we also need to know our biomass of some of our woody species like shrubs and trees. And this is important when we're doing any kind of studies again, whether we're looking at fuels or whether we're looking at bioenergy, carbon sequestration, all of that needs biomass to really understand what's happening on the landscape. So we can't really go and clip a ton of sagebrush, but luckily, a lot of people have clipped a lot and we have some really nice parametric equations. So when I'm out in the field, I usually clip some, obviously, but then I can measure volume of different plants. And to do that, we measure the height of different plants. And then we often take two diameter methods or measurements so we can get a volume of that plant. And then we put them into different equations to estimate biomass. And it works pretty efficiently. It's way easier than going and cutting a bunch of juniper trees, for example. Okay, one more quick example about biomass. This is from some of my research in the past. And again, I'm on a watershed scale and I want to know the biomass of pinyon juniper trees. So I can't go and even measure the volume of all the trees. So we used remote sensing techniques to estimate our biomass. So basically for a known area, we estimated the cover of juniper trees and we used remote sensing to do that. And then we fit it into different equations that we developed to estimate biomass. And we got a really nice relationship between cover and biomass. So it helped us understand on a landscape scale how much production we had at the site and, and really decide on strategies to remove it from the landscape because again, it was encroaching on sagebrush step areas. Structure is another great attribute that often is measured on rangelands. And structure is a three-dimensional arrangement of a plant community. And this is really important, especially when we're considering wildlife species. So we know that we want uh, diversity on our landscape, and that includes plants as well as structure. We want areas where we have hiding cover, where we have thermal cover, but we also want to make sure that we are conscious about areas that might not have any cover. Um, it just depends on the, the species that you're managing for and also your goals. So here's an example of a cover board method on your left or the robo pole on your right. And these are basically to measure the height as well as the vertical density and to look at visual obstruction methods for different wildlife species. Structure is also really important when you're thinking about fuels on a landscape. Um, structure can refer to maybe how a plant, for example, accumulates litter and that's going to change fuel dynamics and fire dynamics. So here's another example of one of my research projects where I'm just looking at plant mortality of a bunch grass. So I want to look at a bunch of different types or species of plants and they, they collect litter different ways. So the structures change, which then changes the dynamics with fire. And sometimes you have higher mortality in some plants than you do in others, but it's good to know so you can structure your restoration methods accordingly. Plant composition is another thing that we often want to know on a landscape and plant composition refers to the proportion of the community based on biomass or cover of various plants or life forms depending on the questions that you're going to ask. So this is really important because it gives you an idea of dominance on the landscape and that can help you again plan what kind of management activities you might want to do or to measure whether you're actually moving in the right direction according to your objectives. So we're actually going to calculate the plant composition for this hypothetical community. 
So here you can see on our functional groups, we have shrubs, we have tall grasses, short grasses, perennial and annual forbs, and annual grasses that are introduced, so things like cheatgrass. And then we have the foliar cover that we estimated. So we would have went out with quadrats or using the line point intercept method and, under, and uh, collected cover information for that community. We then want to calculate the plant composition. So to do that, it's a two-step process. The first thing you want to do is sum up the total cover that you have. So here we added 40, 30, 15, 18, 5, and 2, and we got a foliar cover of 110. We then want to calculate the composition of those functional groups. So we divide each of the individual foliar covers by the total foliar covers and then multiply it by 100% to get the composition. So for example, for shrubs, we have 40% cover and we want to divide that by our total cover, which is 110. We then multiply it by 100 and we get 36.4%. So now on your note guide, you have this table, and I would like you to go through and calculate the composition for each of these different functional groups. And here are the answers for the plant composition table. Just a helpful hint, uh, make sure that you can do all the calculations that we've talked about today. Whether that's frequency, density, cover, or plant composition, all of them are fair game for the next exam. So just make sure that you understand the process and the calculations. And if you don't, then please contact your instructor. Your bonus method that we're just going to hurry and talk about is photo monitoring. And we talked a little bit about photo monitoring in the last lecture. But I just want to reemphasize that this is a, a great place to start anytime you're doing monitoring. And if you don't have time or resources to do any of the other strategies, at least do photo monitoring. You can whip out your phone follow a few different rules, and take some photos that can be really useful to understand change on the landscape. So here's a photo that's looking down on a plot. It's a one by one meter or a one meter square plot. And then the photo on the right is one of a landscape. These are both really good photos because they tell you exactly where they are. They tell you the date that the information was collected, they, um, the photo, for example, of the landscape is using a GPS-enabled camera, so you have the lat and long, you have a compass that tells you the position that you're looking at. So all of this information is really critical when you're doing photo monitoring. Here's just a photo monitoring guide that was put together by Amanda Gerhardt. And you can go through and look at the different steps and read a little bit about photo monitoring. I also put a sample of things that you would consider putting on your whiteboard. A photo without a whiteboard really is not useful, so it's something that we definitely encourage uh, people to use and to have with them when they're doing photo monitoring. And just to emphasize how cool photo monitoring can be, we'll just try and go through this time series. So again, this is from a study looking at pinion and juniper removal. Um, it's an area that's being encroached, and so our goal of this was to create a healthy rangeland system. Our objective was to reduce pinyon juniper trees, to reduce bare ground because we started to have a lot of erosion on these hill slopes, and also increase our perennial bunch grasses. So those three objectives are all measurable and they meet the SMART objectives. And then over time, you can see the change in our treatments. So here we did a cut and drop treatment where we just cut down the juniper trees. And so you can see the photo on the right is one year after our treatment. This is two years after our treatment. So again, you can see we did reduce pinion junipers because we cut them down. We're starting to see a reduction of our bare ground, and we're starting to see an increase in our perennial bunch grasses. And as we go on farther, you can see that we're even seeing more of an increase in our perennial bunch grasses and a decrease in our bare ground. So even just doing repeated photos can really help you assess whether you're meeting your objectives. And again, if your resources are limited, this is a great place to start. We barely scratched the surface of some of the monitoring techniques that you could use on rangeland. And um, because of that, I would encourage you to go and look at the Landscape Toolbox. This is a great website that tells you and shows you. It has video training. It's very descriptive on different monitoring techniques 
that you could use to measure whether you're moving in the right direction on the rangeland or whether you're meeting your objectives and goals. So again, here's a link to the website. Take a few minutes today to at least go in and familiarize yourself with the, the tools that are there. And, and we're pretty lucky at the University of Idaho. One of the main people that put this together is Dr. Jason Carl, who's now at the University of Idaho. So if you have any questions about it, I'm sure he would be more than willing to help you walk through it, um, as would I. So it's a really great tool. Again, I encourage you to take a few minutes to look at it.